Comic Con at home. Hope you're enjoying not being in San Diego, and thank you for checking this out. My name's Johnny Kolosinski. I'm a podcaster who spent a lot of time working in the entertain or in the arts and entertainment industry. Uh, this is a panel on uh, making a living being creative. We're going to talk about breaking into uh, the uh, the creative and entertainment fields uh, and what life is like once you're actually working. Uh, with me on the panel. Uh, we have uh, AC Bradley. A AC, do you want to introduce, introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Um, my name is AC Bradley. I'm a writer, so that's the area of creativity I specialize in. Um, I've worked on Troll Hunters, Three Below for Netflix, and I'm currently the head writer and executive producer on Marvel's What If. Awesome. Uh, also, and, uh, oh. uh, we have, uh, sorry, Jess, <laughs> uh, Jess, I'm sorry, is it Kufi? Uh, Cuff. Cuff, like, sorry Cuff about like. that. Uh, yeah, no worries. <laughs> Jess, uh, Jess Cuff, mm -hmm. you want to introduce yourself a, bit, a little bit as well? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Jess. I'm a storyboard artist working in the animation industry. Um, speaking of Marvel, uh, got the chance to work uh, with Marvel Animation on shows like Avengers Assemble, Black Panther's Quest, Spider-Man, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the most recent uh, Maximum Venom. Um, as well as the Guardians of the Galaxy TV show. And I'm currently working on, uh, just recently cool. announced by WB, Gremlins Secrets of the Marvel. Fantastic. Uh, and also with us is uh, Lee Cozy. Uh, so I'm Lee Cozy. I'm a freelance artist in the entertainment industry. I primarily do artwork for DreamWorks and Lucasfilm, uh, primarily on Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, as, as I guess as far as my Marvel connection, uh, I actually did uh, licensing stuff for Marvel many times over. <laughs> uh, so obviously, uh, this is a little bit different than uh, normal panels that we'd be doing at Comic-Con this year. So uh, we're recording this remotely, as a lot of the panels that you've probably seen have been. Uh, so bear with <laughs> us with any technical issues and things like that, but we're going to get right into it. Um, I guess the main, I, everyone gets their start in the industry a little bit differently, but a lot of it has to do with taking the time to build your skills. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about how you trained uh, both academically and then in those first, uh, first roles, how you get, what your first job in the industry was and what you learned from that. Uh, Jess, do you want to start us off? Uh, sure. Um, uh, I uh, went to school at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco, um, studying in uh, 2D animation, actually. Um, uh, I got to learn several different skills that apply to 2D animation as a whole, not just as an animator, but character design, prop design, environments, storyboarding, especially. Um, and uh, I was given the chance, uh, one of my first jobs was doing freelance character design for Marvel Animation. Um, originally for, I believe it was season uh, three of Avengers Assemble. So. Uh, and a AC, how did you, uh, what did you, did you study uh, screenwriting or? Yeah, I went to um, University of Southern California Film School. And then afterwards I worked in the industry for a couple of years as an assistant, which I highly recommend just because you learn the production and the business side of the business. Uh, at the same time, I would write every morning. I think that's a lot of mistakes people make. They assume that you can only write or work in the industry in a non-writing capacity. So I would get up every morning at six, write for two to three hours, and then I would put on my headsets and I'd roll calls at a literary management company. But it was great because it was like a master's class in how you actually have a writing career. And then while I was on that desk, I started um, submitting to contests and I sold my first pilot, I sold my first feature. Um, I got to walk into my boss's office one day and go, so you've got a 3 p.m. in Beverly Hills and I've got a 4 p.m. at Warner Brothers. So I'm just gonna <laughs> head out afterwards and I'll see you tomorrow. Awesome. And he went, you do realize you gotta quit now, right? <laughs> I just I can't have a pilot. <laughs> went, at least he was amical about it. I was it. like, yeah. Oh, well, my response was even worse. I went, yeah, but it's, and he's a really good guy. I went, yeah, but it's, at the time it was uh, right before Christmas. I was like, I know you're giving us all iPhones for Christmas, so I'm staying. <laughs> I was like, I'll quit in January. I want my bonus. Gotta capitalize and on those perks. And he was like, what? I was like, you had me order them. 
Yeah, he was having me order uh, personalized iPhones for the whole office. I'm like, I am fucking, I am not. I am staying for this. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> dang. Now, uh, did you end up talking to him about representation? Uh, we had already had that conversation. He was, he represented a lot of A-list clients mm -hmm. and really great guys. Um, I needed a younger manager who was hungrier. So right. I signed with these two young guys who were the ones who got like my pilot to the right hands, who were hustling. Um, that's another thing you kind of, as you build a writing career, your management needs change mm -hmm. and grow. And you can't always stick with the first person you're with. And it's not even, it's never personal. It's always a business thing. And we're, like I've had now like three agents and I've had managers. I don't have one anymore. Uh, I think the longest person on my team is my lawyer and I love my lawyer and I highly recommend. I think that's another mistake some young people do is that they don't understand the worth of a lawyer, mm -hmm. but I have, I will never ever negotiate my own contract. And um, Marvel called me up to be like, why don't we just hash this out ourselves? And I went, that is never happening. Yeah, because <laughs> never what you really want happening. is like, a napkin <laughs> deal with Disney. Yeah. <laughs> I as long like, as it's is, notarized. Like, to be honest. <laughs> right. Yeah. I was like, go call my lawyer. He's amazing. Because the sad thing is, if you guys offered me, like, you know, a sweatshirt and a sandwich, I'm like, sure, let's do it. <laughs> I was like, I need someone who actually will make sure I can pay my rent. <laughs> we'll, like, defend. So. We'll, like, actually stand up for you, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I think we could do, like, oh, yeah, a I've... complete panel yeah. on, on just on, on that early representation. Um, and yeah. and and making those progressions because it's like to me that's as somebody who's a little bit outside of that aspect of things it's just mm -hmm. really fascinating um the, the idea of having somebody yeah. fighting in your corner like that or multiple people and like you said of having uh knowing that hey sometimes the great person isn't the right person for me well it's also don't forget yeah. like the, I mean, the I, idea of like yeah. the contracts so mm -hmm. that's uh, 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 Lee, do you want to introduce yourself and how you got started in the industry? Um, so uh, I'm self-taught, and essentially, uh, while I was in the Marine Corps, I was doing uh, artwork for like rock magazines and like underground, like local rock magazines and alt lifestyle magazines. Uh, I was doing artwork for uh, just you know a bunch of underground books and stuff. And then my friends and I did a comic book together, and I started doing fan art. And the uh, essentially my big break came when we launched uh, my comic book Kindergoth, and uh, it we generated this huge line at Comic Con, and a bunch of people you know got in line to, to pick it up. But one of the people that got in line was actually an art director for uh, a licensing uh, company or a company that had licensed Lord of the Rings. And when he saw my Lord of the Rings fan art on display at the table, uh, he hired me on the spot. So it's basically it kind of come down to just get your art out there, make sure it's visible. And, you know, that's kind of what happened to me. So I was, but again, I was, I was self-taught. I never had the money to actually go to school. Yeah. Um, even, uh, uh, even with me actually going to school, that's kind of, that's kind of how uh, I was able to work into the uh, freelance character design for Marvel animation. Um, when I was offered the job, I was actually working. I had been working two years back at my school um, it's like that in between after college when you're still like living with your parents and trying to mm -hmm. figure stuff out and you studied so long, but you don't know how it applies. So I knew that I wanted to get into the industry, but in San Francisco, it was just a little bit harder if you weren't getting into like mobile games and things like that. I had done, mm -hmm. uh, that was actually one of my real first jobs was helping edit the, uh, uh, it was, uh, um, like around Hotel Transylvania kind of time where everybody was doing draw overs of like, this is how you should really feel this pose and blah, blah, blah. So I was doing that for a mobile game or like for several mobile games up in uh, San Francisco. But I was still working as a lab technician for the stop motion department at the Academy of Arts. And I had coincidentally, uh, uh, I was in, I was at the front desk when uh, one of my previous teachers who was the head of the department, uh, Beth Souza, she came in and said, hey, we don't have enough people to work uh, Spring Show, which is a huge event that the Academy throws on for all their graduated students and stuff. Do you mind working Spring Show? It's just 
making sure everybody gets portfolio reviews and making sure to kind of trim the chaos, show everybody what lunches. And I'm like, yeah, sure. I don't really have anything going on this Saturday. <laughs> so I went and as I was working the floor, uh, two, two guys who eventually became my bosses, uh, uh, Howard and Ken, um, they were there doing portfolio reviews for Marvel. And uh, Beth comes over and she's like, hey, can you show these guys where lunch is? So I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and somehow some sort of fate or, or somebody, somebody was looking out for me <laughs> because we go over to where the lunch is and we're told actually lunch has been delayed uh, because of a small fire in the kitchen. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, do you guys want me to show you around? And so I spent the next like 10 minutes talking to them about me, about how I was like studying, about all these other students and all the work and stuff like that. And they're like, hey, uh, if we see you around, we should talk more. I'm like, 100%, totally. Not really expecting a lot. Mm -hmm. And so then periodically over the next like, like three hours, they came and sat by my table at lunch and talked to me. Like I went mm -hmm. up to kind of show a couple of extra people and they're like, oh, hey, I'm like, hey guys. And then suddenly Beth grabs me by the shoulders towards the end of the event sits me in a chair and she's like you have your ipad right and i'm like yes <laughs> they're like okay just pull it up and i'm like okay and she brings ken and howard over and i'm like hi they're like we already knew you <laughs> i know and i ended up showing them my fan work from like the flash uh like nice. the hugest comic book fan so i'm showing off a lot of my work i show off some of the early spider-man that i had did and that was kind of the key uh ken was like so do you want do you want to let me know when you come down to LA, like you could take a tour and stuff. And that's, that's where it took off from there. Really. Now was your portfolio pinup art or was it sequential art or, you know, was it finished uh, it art? Was, it was more finished pieces and it was a lot of character pieces and something that, um, so it was I like just, turnarounds it, and character design type stuff. I, it was actually more like story moments. So it was okay. more characters actually in action doing things. Um, uh, cause more often than not, I had, uh, example, I had early examples of storyboard work and um, uh, uh, that I had been doing on my own. So I had some of those to be able to show them. But for the most part, I had like a lot of my uh, uh, character illustrations of them being in a story moment. And that's something uh, I tend to recommend to a lot of artists that ask advice about portfolios and stuff, especially trying to get into animation. You want to show that you can see whatever you create in pre-production through to the final mm -hmm. product. So the best thing you can do is create an illustration that shows a story moment. If you want to show off your sense of color, capitalize how color tells a story, what emotion is it telling. If you want to capitalize on character design, show your characters doing something, make them interesting to somebody to get them to feel like I want to watch them doing things. You know, when you're creating a storyboard of something, make this moment special make it feel like you were seeing the behind the scenes in a film you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so both lee and jess got a, at least a partially i mean obviously the talent was a big part of it but showing working with with fan art essentially uh working with with other people's mm -hmm. um creations and and your own takes on them uh ac you said that you did a lot of uh before before you sold your your pilot uh, you did a lot of writing in the beginning. Was it all mostly pilot work? Were you doing spec scripts where you're working with other people's uh, creative, you know, other series and things as well? Or was it all uh, new creations of yours? Oh, I, I couldn't afford to uh, copyright any IP. It was all <laughs> original stuff, um, all original materials, a lot of just like features and pilots. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because I've, <laughs> I never wrote uh, there's a thing in, co in film school, they try and make you write, um, it's not spec episodes, it's like where you mimic an episode that's already on television. Mm -hmm. And I never completed that class at <laughs> USC. <laughs> I had, I wrote like half of a Deadwood episode, I think, and I never finished it, or a house episode. And I was just like, eh, I don't wanna do this. And then <laughs> flash forward 10 years, and my job is literally to mimic the entire MCU right now. Right. Um, but I always, <laughs> had I've always been really good with dialogue and I can have a he ear for it so I knew how to like I, I just I always was able to mimic um like in film school once the professor had a very unusual way of talking 
and I was bored and we had to do scene work. So I used his voice for one of the characters and he was like, I love this scene. This character is <laughs> real. I'm like, a plus. And everyone else in the class was like, he literally talks. Yeah, it was like everyone else in the class was like, she just took your, you're just, sorry, I keep cursing. She just <laughs> took your um, speech patterns. Uh, but yeah, I never did spec work like that. Um, I was definitely inspired. My first pilot was like very much inspired by Jason Bourne and Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. It was this notion of a genetically engineered super soldier was actually a college dropout sorority girl who was like, <laughs> just living a mess, who was like 22, with purple hair, and like dropped out of college because awesome. she had an affair with the dean's husband. <laughs> and she discovers that she's actually, she was genetically engineered to be a, like a, like Jason Bourne meets Spider-Man. And she's like, I am not the person that saves a cat from a tree. <laughs> and then of course, rising to the occasion. Um, but I think that's a lot true for a lot of writers because if it's based on, if you write something that's based on another IP that you don't own the rights to, you can't sell it. So there's no chance of monetizing. And mm-hmm. sometimes buyers don't really want to read it then. So mm-hmm. I, I, there is a real push these days to write original pilots. Even if they never do sell, just like a, your original thoughts, original features will go from there. Um, but I love what you were saying about storyboard artists, Jess. Like it is true, like showing emotion in a board mm-hmm. it means so much in a character and the character design, not like over the top, but just some sense of that we, that there's something going on beyond the image. Exactly. Like you want to make sure, uh, uh, because that's something that is, at least I felt was a little bit skipped or covered a little bit too loosely Mm -hmm. is everybody in the industry. If you're going for a character design job, everybody in the industry already expects you to know how to do turns possibly how to design props Mm -hmm. and how to put your characters into backgrounds. Like that's going to be the job. So they want to see the extra that you bring, which is why you, 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 uh, sorry to interrupt. What do you mean by doing turns? Um, uh, uh, turnarounds. turnarounds. Yeah. Like character turnarounds that tends to be a, a, especially a typical thing in animation where, uh, for the animators, whatever character design that you do, uh, you need to make sure that you have designed it from all angles because you're, uh, for example, with Captain America, uh, we need to know exactly how his shoulder straps attached in the back to hook his shield on to the back of his costume. We need to know how his boots buckled, how far around his gloves went, if they were fingerless or not mm-hmm. all the way through. Like uh, for uh, another good example You is... need to have the prime shot of America's mm-hmm. bottom. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we had perfect just... shots of those. <laughs> um, uh, we also, especially as a good example for uh, Maximum Venom, Spider-Man's uh, costume has a little bit of an upgrade where he has blue palms. Uh, but on the counter side of his hand, he still has red webbing. You needed to you need to know all of those angles and send that to the animators so they can move the character properly through space. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's a really good segue. We talked a little bit about you know uh, how how y'all got your start. Um, what's now now that you're working and you know have the big kid jobs. Um, uh, what's what's your day to day life like now, and uh, how's that changed from the the freelance or the um, or, or the assistant uh, work? Uh, AC, do you um, want to start us off? Well, for me, sure. Uh, for me, I was freelance for a number of years as a writer, um, doing episodes here and there, and then getting staffed on a show you're suddenly in a room for like 10 a.m. until basically the showrunner is like, I'm going home now. You're like, okay, cool, we can go home now too. Um, as I move forward and upward, especially into the producing side, you have to learn how to take care of your crew and you have to develop soft people skills of just being able to hear what's going on and knowing when it's your place to intervene and when it's not. Because uh, there's always gonna be like a crew, you're talking about 200 people who spend 40 to 50 hours a week together. So there's always going to be, it's like family. There's going to be times when you love them and there's going to be times when you hate them. Uh, So just understanding the emotions and the characters and the personalities and that everyone is kind of still on on team show. Uh, 
So developing people skills as you move forward becomes more and more important and being able to articulate, especially in animation, like with the storyboard artists and with the designers and being able to just talk back and forth and find an understanding. Like I honestly knew very little about animation six years ago, but now I'm all like, yep, T poses and <laughs> turnarounds and uh, you just, you need to be able to describe it and letting go a little bit too, letting the storyboard artists kind of put their fingerprints on the script and on the boards, like having their say, because their job is also to plus things at times and just being able to like kind of take a step back and be like, what I wrote on the page was fun and great. Now let's make it 10 times better because we always, there's always room for improvement. Yeah, I 100% I, I agree with that. It is something that is super important, especially coming from school and now actually being in the business for several years is mm -hmm. capitalizing on that, on that natural kind of sense of collaboration. You are, especially in, in animation and when you're getting into entertainment and stuff, even on some freelance gigs, you are working with other people. You have to work with other people. Uh, and these folks might have really interesting ideas. They might not have super great ideas. You might think that the idea is too complex now, but once you work through it, turns out it was great the whole time. You just don't know, but you have to be willing to take that kind of a leap with other folks because mm -hmm. they all, you have to entrust in them that they all want to see this project become amazing, just like you do. <laughs> and also it's, it's a, a key thing is when you're collaborating like that, um, the class, the, sometimes you, like I've run into it in the comic book industry in particular is there would be a, uh, a kind of a clash sometimes of creative egos. And so that, that actually, it, I feel usually is very detrimental to the overall project. So if everybody can talk to each other as equals, regardless of who's top build or something like that, it's always really cool to get everybody's feedback and then just choose the best path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much agree. Yeah. Uh, is there something that you particularly look for in a collaborator? Uh, Jess, you want to start us off? Um, I, <laughs> I tend to be really excited about projects. So I'm like, oh, what if we could do that? What if it comes into here? And like adding sound effects as I'm describing something. Uh, but I, <laughs> especially with like a collaborator, what really goes like, uh, um, what really goes far for me is them being able to come with me when it comes to visualizing something like, um, or, or giving, giving me the chance to flush out this idea because I will have, especially as a board artist, and this is a common habit that a lot of board artists have, you'll, as you're reading the script, you see the movie playing. So your job is to get this movie down on paper as best you can. And then it's like on the editing room floor in a sense, where you're back and forth with the writers or with your director, episode director, supervisor director, whoever, that is like, well, maybe we can cut this scene, we can trim this scene, we could do this, blah, 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 but you got your film out, right? Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to a collaborator, it's great to have somebody that's willing to give you that chance to think out your concept and then they want to plus it. They're not bringing you down with like, but you didn't do it the way that I wanted it though. Mm -hmm. How was I supposed to know? My job is to put down what I interpreted and then you tell me, okay, this works, this doesn't, this is good, change this, blah, blah. So there's always going to be editing all the way through pre-production, all the way through production, and then into post. By the time the episode comes out, it is not 100% what it was at the start, but it is the result of mm -hmm. everybody working together to try to make the best thing that they're trying to do. What she said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I can't really top it. It's, it's pretty much bang on, so. Yeah, um, I think we develop relationships too. Like I've, like my editors right now in the show, this is our third show together. I would follow them into battle. I love them. We have a shorthand now with everything. I trust them. Like it's just, mm -hmm. I trust them. Like do, yeah. Like they'll call up and be like, oh, I have this idea for an, uh, a sequence. And my thing is usually, does it contradict anything in the show? <laughs> is mm -hmm. it going to create a story problem? If not, 
Let's no. do it. Let's I do I, it. I trust yeah. you. Yeah, like, yeah, like you guys know the show as well as I do. I'm just looking at the macro level of, oh no, we can't do that because I think one of the movies is doing it. Um, <laughs> great <laughs> idea, but we're kind of. You can't blow up the moon. We have a base um, there in episode then, four. Okay. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that has happened. Um, but like right now I'm developing um, a feature with a very close friend of mine who's um, an independent director, Shauna Winslow. And it's been one of the most rewarding kind of strange experiences because we've known each other for over 10 years. We were assistants back in the day together and sh we've supported each other's careers over the years, like I read her de de uh, directorial debut seven years ago, and now it's finally coming out. Uh, she asked the project we're working on together with the script it was one of my first scripts I ever sold. And she's like, that's always been one of my favorite things of yours. Would you let me have your baby? Like, let me, let me take this, let's do this together now that we're older and we're more established and make this real. And I'm like, yeah, I can't imagine a better person to work with than someone who I've literally called up and been like, he cheated on me. <laughs> and he's been like my best friend. And that's what I look for now is the friendship, like not just working together, but like, can I actually, can we, can you come over to my house to barbecue when the world reopens? Like, can we actually <laughs> be something more? Cause yeah, yeah. work can't yeah. just be work. We work so much, it has to be built into our lives. Yeah, it's, it's what we're kind of, what we're ending up creating is supposed to is supposed to incite joyful exciting sometimes even like frustrated or angry or sad but it's supposed to elicit those kinds of extreme emotions that you would experience with somebody that you're close to you're describing these stories about characters that are living life you want somebody that's able to come with you on that kind of journey and want to actively be there with you that's those are the best mm -hmm. folks on a production we definitely had that kind of camaraderie yeah. at marvel animation and it was oh it was it's, just so much fun to do stuff it's good. and then for me it's also things like um uh i like i i just met jess today but kind of the whole you know making noises we were talking about making stupid faces and trying to figure stuff out and for me <laughs> when i'm collaborating with people i love collaborating with people who are fun and energetic and so, like, just hearing her talk about the type of work environment she wants, I want to work with Jess on a project at some point because that's the type, because I love that, just that high energy. Like, that's what I feed off of. I feed off of, you know, uh, the positivity. I feed off the creativity. I feed off of the wit. Um, my personal favorite collaborator I ever worked with was uh, Len Wein, who was uh, mostly famous for creating Wolverine and relaunching the X-Men. Um, but uh, he and I collaborated on Kindergoth, and it was funny because we were sitting there and writing the scripts in his house. Uh, we wrote all these scripts in like one day, and it was just pretty much we we sat in his house, and it was, you know, you know, what should the power supply be for this, you know, this you know super high tech weapon? It's like it's going to be a nuclear bomb. It's or it's going to be a, you know, it's going to be a fusion reactor. It's going to be you know he's going to plug it in. He's going to disassemble a blender. He's going to and he's like I got a ten pound bag of potatoes over there. I bet we can make a battery out of that. And suddenly awesome. this whole thing became stand up improv, and that <laughs> ended up making it into the scripts for these books. And so it's things like there's a scene in the book where there's like baby Jesus is walking around. It's basically we have a character named Kinder Jesus, and he's walking around through public school and everywhere he goes indoors there's a beam of light following him and it was just like sight gags and silly things like that and it was just so much fun working on and so it, it's for me it's 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 that wit it's that humor you know of the collaborator and then when you know when you get those like personalities together um mm -hmm. you know it's it's people who are dangerous having in the same room together those are fun that's that's what yeah, i like awesome. those are yeah. always awesome <laughs> <laughs> um Jess and AC, you both brought up uh, giving and getting notes, uh, and like mm -hmm. like it or not, no matter where you are in your career, um, you're going to either get criticism uh, or you're going to get feedback of that's great, but we can't do that. Um, how do you internalize that without taking it personally? And I, AC, as a um, side tangent, how do you how do you deliver that without you know, being the hammer? Uh, well, there's always two kinds of notes. There's the notes where it's production notes, where it's just like money. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do this because of money. And you're like, okay, 
Let yeah. me go and figure out how do we do a version of this. And that's when you go, literally, I used to wander the um, three below, we had a budget crisis. And so I was notorious for wandering where the VFX and the modelers were being like, what can I do for free? <laughs> what can I do for cheap? And they would be like, oh, we can do this for like $10. And I'm like, yes. And I put it in a script and it'd be in a production meeting. I get, that's expensive. I'm like, no. They told me I could do it for ten dollars. <laughs> so we're not doing it. Um, it's like just, Tom and just, Tom, Tom and <laughs> Tweening will do it for sandwiches. Like, right? <laughs> I was like, Kundo already found me the sheep. We're stealing the sheep from Shrek. <laughs> I need a model of a sheep, and they're like, I was like, they already found one. We're stealing an old one from like the servers. Um, but when it comes to creative notes. Everyone, even if the note's a bad note, they're trying to make it better. Mm -hmm. So your job is to listen and to hear what the note is, where the note's coming from. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's not, they're like, I, I had one who went to know on a feature and the executive, the studio executive was really smart and he was really great. And he kept giving me a note and I had no idea what he meant, no idea. And he's like, we wanted to be like a unicorn, but girl next door. And I'm like, what does that mean? What is a horse? <laughs> oh my gosh. No. And Getting PTSD finally, flashbacks he went from that. <laughs> and he was amazing. He went, finally, he just leaned in. He went, Ashley, this is Disney. We need to have a princess element. I went, oh, that I can give you. It's a makeover. That's a boy. That's a party. He went, what? I was like, I can do that. I was like, now I get it. Like, yes, you're, I wasn't thinking. You, This is the company. This is the brand. You need me to reflect the brand. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. And he's like, you got it? I was like, it's going to give me a few weeks. But yeah, I got it. <laughs> Sometimes it's just breaking through that communication barrier and that's part of your job. And then every once in a while you get a note that's bad and you go, let me think on it. And you go and think on it and you're like, well, it's still bad. And then you either tell them, hey, thanks for the note. This is why it didn't work. Or you do all their other notes and pretend they don't notice that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's, uh, uh, we have kind of like, we have kind of like the same thing, when, especially when it comes to like that communication issue being like well it kind of feels like it should have more like oomph to it right maybe 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 the explosion <laughs> needs to feel more explosiony and you're like what <laughs> what are you talking about man yeah <laughs> like that's the uh there were a lot of cases on um uh especially getting into like uh um into later seasons of avengers and getting into black panther's quest where mm -hmm. uh you're going through like certain fight scenes or like certain changes and uh, especially as a storyboard artist and especially in action you have to be incredibly yeah. conscious of the weight of the movement where they've started where they're ending all that staging mm -hmm. everything you have to be aware of it through the whole process so when you would get notes back about a fight scene like luckily especially uh, uh my director tim eldred and then our supervising director, um, uh, Jeff Allen, uh, they were both very conscious about how the, f the point of the fight scene. So when you would get notes back, it was still trying to either in keeping with the fight scene that you're already going through, or it's kind of changing the point, but it is still understanding that we don't want you to literally overhaul everything but if you change this, this, this here, it still adds up all together. So, and that's mm -hmm. something that uh, uh, as a board artist, like over, especially over the years, I've had to be okay with. Being a board artist is like being an animator where you are drawing a billion drawings for somebody to move through a sequence mm -hmm. for X amount of minutes. Like when you have a sequence that comes out to four minutes, that's a lot of work for four minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, uh, you have to accept that there is entirely the possibility that your director will come back and they'll be like, I'm not really feeling this. Can you go over the section again? That's just what happens as a board artist. That's just how life is. Yeah. You, you're, everybody is trying to get the best result out of the script, out of the concept that you guys are trying to build up. Right. So, so in the process of getting the critiques, don't be married to your work. Don't be in love with it so much that you're not willing to make the yeah. changes. Exactly. And Every yeah. time your director or your producer or someone gives you notes, they're not saying you're a bad worker. They're not saying that you're a bad person. They are saying, because 
I want you to work on this. I am telling you what you should work on. I want you to work on this. I value you as a worker, which is why I'm asking you to do this work. That's, that is the internalization you should really have because on top of all of us having such a great time, making super great friends and collaborating awesomely, it is also still a job. It's also still a business. Yeah. If they want you to do good work, they will tell you. If they didn't want you to do good work, you wouldn't have this job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're already mm -hmm. wanting you in this position when they give you those notes. I, I think mm -hmm. we've asked this that question six or seven times now over the course of this panel, and the they're telling you this because they want you to be the one to do the work is the like most inspiring, mm -hmm. awesome answer I've ever heard. Yeah, I love it. You, you, um, and then usually it's like you know, but but it's also the other thing is like the the critiques have to be the notes are essentially critiques and they have to be constructive. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, the thing like she was talking is like, you know, the make the explosion, you know, more boomy kind of stuff. It's I the the two that I usually give as an example is I've received two critiques. One was, can you make them look a little more douchey? Which was in <laughs> reference to a character series of character <laughs> designs. <laughs> I have to sit there and go, huh? <laughs> But the, the gentleman directing the project was like, they look good. They look awesome. I love these. But can they be a little more douchey? And so then Is I had to me? sit. Exact, yeah, that was, that was, well, that was actually Nick. But it was, okay. it was your project. <laughs> but I had to actually sit down with Nick and try to figure out exactly what are we doing with these. And finally, when he said, well, they're kind of bro type characters, it's like, oh, okay, now I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, but just randomly going, they should be a little more douchey. I'm like, explain. And yeah. then. I had another client one time who came back and said, this is great. This is beautiful. I love everything about it. Can you make it about 20% more awesome? And I'm oh, like, no. that is really arbitrary. <laughs> like, I think, I, I think it was actually like, can you make it like 23% yeah, more awesome? So it was like, it wasn't even like a round number. It was just what like, what is that you know, extra 3%? Like 17% you know, more doodads. It's like, I don't know what you want. <laughs> um, you know, can you explain this? And so it, you have to sit there and kind of, you know, talk with them and, and hope that in that conversation you get clarity. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite art mm -hmm. director, uh, and the funny thing is, is he and I have swapped places as far as who art directs who periodically. But my favorite art director ever is actually mm -hmm. a gentleman named Tommy Yoon from Harmony Gold. He's working on Robotech right now. And I was looking around a minute ago because I actually have his stuff in that drawer. I put it there yesterday. I was going to grab it and show it on camera. But um, uh, he actually, you know, he, he will literally send me back my drawings with really quick Photoshop edits and stuff saying, okay, fix this, pull mm -hmm. this leg back, do this, do this, do this, do this. And it's such crystal clear direction. Mm -hmm. And then I can go and finish the painting or finish the image I'm working on. And it is bang on. And we, we, we rip through projects so fast because the direction mm -hmm. and the notes are crystal clear and there's no question what he wants. That was the yeah. same thing with uh, uh, with what Jeff and Tim and uh, even direction that I got from um, like James Yang and Jeff Walmister over on Guardians of the Galaxy. Like all those guys, when they would send back notes on boards, they have stuff written in the margin. Mm -hmm. Be like, can you actually do this instead? Maybe you could shoot the shot like this. Like you could really see mm -hmm. what they were visualizing, and you're like, I appreciate you. <laughs> yes. Thank you for being clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's the the less. I can be, yeah. or the more I'll, I can be instinctive and the less I have to be analytical, mm -hmm. the better the project will usually be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, cause as yeah. artists, we are visual storytellers. So kind of yes. what you were, actually what you were talking about earlier with the portfolio of having that kind of like showcase pieces that show what the entire scene is showing like an, uh, you know, a story within the elements, you know, for what we do, I, I, we refer to that as narrative art for the most part. It's kind of mm -hmm. like the Norman Rockwell mm -hmm. thing. It's like tell a story yeah. in one image. And so that's, you know, that's like, that's what I'm in love with. That's my personal specialty. That's what I'm mm -hmm. constantly obsessed with. And I analyze all kinds of like, I, I love going through other artists, like preliminary sketches through their final sketches and trying to figure out well I like this one better from a compositional standpoint, but it doesn't tell the story as well as this one does. And so, you know, mm -hmm. you figure out why he made choices mm -hmm. through that creative process. And uh, so that's, yeah, so that's a key thing is that idea just in a single frame tell the most complete, concise story you can. And when you have somebody that can visually, or that can verbally communicate that to you so that you can visually communicate it to anybody who walks by and looks at that picture. It's yeah. awesome. Exactly, super agree. Um, so you, everybody talked a little bit about how they got started. Um, if with your experience now, you could 
time machine and other than saying, you know, um, buy Bitcoin and invest in masks, uh, <laughs> if you could mentor yourself at, <laughs> at that point in time, um, is there something that you would have looked to teach yourself or someone else who, you know, with your similar skill set that would be coming up now? Um, I would probably say to be a little bit adventurous. Um, uh, oftentimes I had stuff that I actually did like, uh, that I would go through and uh, like, you have those kinds of drawings that you're just doing where you're either just kind of stretching your arms or however, or you have those drawings where I don't know what this idea is going to be, but I'm just going to go and see where it takes me, whatever. Um, earlier on, uh, especially during school, I had the habit of being like, this piece has to be done. This has to be the done piece. Mm -hmm. I don't get time for like sketches or thinking drawings or anything like that. Like once I put pen to paper, I need to be done. And then you'd end up with that uh, analysis paralysis where you're like, now I don't know what to draw. <laughs> so it's feeling, feeling okay with being loose about your thoughts. That's something that's taken uh, uh, that I had to jump on pretty quickly getting into boards, but it's detrimental to my job now is just going on paper. Either um, uh, my personal process is I will write out my shots list based on what I'm imagining on from the script. And then from that shots list, I'll now do another editing pass of going through and doing all these drawings. And then we'll edit again and edit again and edit again as it's going through the boards process. So it's constant drawing, trying to, uh, uh, it's constantly going at a big block of marble and you just have to keep chipping. You gotta be okay with keep chipping. If you chip a little too far on one spot, sand that out, work with it. See if you can figure out something around it. Like you need to be okay to be loose enough to get your ideas out on paper. Cause there's, especially for most visual artists that I've talked to, there's a lot going on up here. <laughs> so it's, it's a million <laughs> thoughts at once that you need to be okay sorting through on paper. And I'm gonna agree really fast. I'm gonna agree 100% with that and then hand it right over to AC because we've got like two minutes left. Yeah, we've got just. <laughs> Oh, you, AC. Me? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I, oh, uh, for writers, I would say just keep writing. Write every day. This industry is going to hit you more than it hugs you. Just every day, wake up, go to the computer, write, write what you want, write what interests you, especially for women writers, women, uh, people of color, and LGBTQT+. Like, write your stories. Write what you want. And um, do not try and write a dick wolf tv show <laughs> like don't so much of our media has been decided by white heterosexual men that we think that's what we have to do and it's not it's not go write what interests you what you find weird and funny and interesting if it's something connected to your life great if it's something not i was never a spy and i wrote spy, no, uh spy screenplays just entertain yourself because the more fun that you're having on the page the more fun the reader will have and then hopefully the viewer yeah, and it's whatever you're doing, you should love what you're doing. So it's, you know, uh, mm -hmm. if you're doing something that feels like a chore, find something in it that you mm -hmm. or find something in your job that you love and you won't feel like you're working is the key thing. Mm -hmm. So for me, yeah. anyways, and for me, it would have just been draw yeah. a lot, draw more often. And what's up, uh, and Johnny, mm -hmm. all you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And uh, with that, yeah, that's kind of our time. They're going to kick us out of the virtual room so that they can clear the virtual people out. Uh, and uh, where can uh, people, you can find me on Twitter at Cycloptico or my podcast, Hi Everybody, a Bad Medicine podcast, or the Disco Trek for Got Thrones. Uh, AC, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter as the Ash Bradley, I believe, and Net uh, on Netflix is Three Below and Troll Hunters, and What If hopefully will be in 2021 on Disney Plus. Awesome. And Jeff? Um, you can find me on all the socials, uh, Insta on, uh, especially like Instagram on Twitter as at E V Enchantress, E V I E N C H A N T R E S S. Uh, or you can find my stuff, uh, on Disney plus for, uh, Marvel's Avengers Assemble, Black Panther's Quest, uh, Marvel Spider-Man and Guardians of the Galaxy. 
And Lee Cozy? Um, yeah, if you can spell my last name properly, K-O-H-S-E, you can find me pretty easily. Uh, I'm Lee Cozy on Instagram, Lee Cozy Art on Facebook. And uh, although Kindergoth on Twitter, because that was where I was announcing all the Kindergoth comic updates. But, uh, and also on Twitch at Cozy Art, K-O-H-S-E-A-R-T. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Hopefully, we'll be able to do this again in person uh, next year or at WonderCon. Yeah. Uh, and thanks, Comic-Con, for setting this up and having us. And, yeah, uh, everybody, keep making stuff. Be safe, everyone. Be safe, everybody. <laughs>